It is so good to be together in the house of the Lord. I uh, want to thank all of you for your prayer requests, for your prayers, for the cards, for checking in on me. Um, it's been kind of a, a long month of recovery, but by the grace of God, I'm glad to be back, and it is so good to look out and see these faces. I also want to especially greet those who are joining us online. If everyone wants to turn around, look at that green light in the upper right-hand corner and wave to the folks who are joining us online. We are so glad <laughs> that you are joining us today. We are one church gathered in many places, but the Spirit of God is upon us. Amen? Amen. So today we are going to, of course, things are a little bit different, and we're all being flexible and rolling with that, and we are so thankful for your grace. So I want to invite you to stand and sing. The words will be on the screen. This is Raise a Hallelujah.
Amen. You may be seated. That is uh, a lot better than singing by myself in my living room. I don't know why my husband thinks it's weird that I sing every song when it comes up (laughs) online for church. A couple of announcements before we go to prayer today. Um, If you look in your bulletin, you'll notice, I don't know why that is doing that, sorry. Um, If you look in your bulletin, you'll see that we are having a food pantry back up and running. That will be November 19th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. And we're going to do that drive-through style. Um, So we're still looking for some volunteers. I think one of the life groups has um, stepped up to help out with that, so we're grateful. You will also see information in there about parish nurses, and I believe I have this right, that parish nurses will not be here next week, so please uh, disregard that announcement. But I also wanted to let you know, it seems a little bit crazy that we're just a few weeks away from Thanksgiving, but our Thanksgiving (laughs) offering this year is going to support Camp Ideas, which we know is a program, a month-long program for students with special needs that's held right here at the church. And so if you have offering envelopes, you can put that special offering in the Thanksgiving envelope. You can always go online through our website and give that way. Just make sure you check the box for Thanksgiving offering. Reminders that the older youth group will meet today from 2 to 3.30 so we can get the last of the beautiful weather and hang out outside. I have uh, discount pumpkins in the back of my car right now that we're going to smash this afternoon and talk about lament. (laughs) Yes? Oh, there you go. Perfect. We will (laughs) feed the deer and keep our wildlife safari going back here. Um, Also, just to make sure that you are getting a newsletter, um, it will be coming out this week for November and December. Make sure you read everything that's in there or visit our website. We have all the information in there, even everything you need to know for Advent, for Christmas, all of that stuff. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. Um, I did collect prayer requests this morning. Um, So this morning we'll be praying for Matt's friend who's having surgery. We're praying for Paul Svoboda's son, Jeff, having surgery this week. We're praying for Marion. Hi, Marion, a friend of the Davises. I think she's joining us online this morning, too. We're praying for Elena, who has Bell's palsy. And we're praying for Dick Killen's brother, Tom, who is struggling with liver cancer. Did I miss any prayer requests? Yes. The Logan family, okay. And I forgot to say, remember, since we are live streaming, um, you did a great job, but make sure just first names, if we could. Any others? Okay, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, Before we go to prayer, I just want to pause and recognize the significance of today. Um, I am glad that this is a week that we didn't have to record early because I think it would have been a little silly not to at least say something following yesterday's announcement of a potential president-elect. And I know that many of our hearts today are rejoicing and many of our hearts today are grieving. Adam and I know, and we want to acknowledge, that our congregation is not uniquely red or blue, but we are a people who recognize each other's gifts and differences and choose to work together, traveling the road of faith, so that our entire community can know God's love. And yesterday is not going to change that. Amen? (laughs) We will, together, continue the work of hope, the work of justice, and the work of humility that Jesus has called us to. I also want to take a moment of privilege as a woman in a male-dominated field to recognize the historical significance of yesterday. Setting all politics momentarily aside, I pray that we could recognize as a church the momentous step with the potential election of Vice President Kamala Harris 
our country will see the first woman and the first woman of color in the White House. And when I was a little girl, my mom told me that I could be anything I wanted to be when I grew up. And yesterday, more than ever before, I knew that that was true. And I wanna, looking out here and on the live stream, say thank you to all the women who have come before me, who have struggled, who have fought, who have worked hard to make this a reality. And I hope that the young girls and women of any age who are seeing this happen will be inspired by this new break in the glass ceiling and that we will continue as women and as girls to help each other become the absolute best versions of ourselves. Finally, friends, this morning, I want to encourage you that our work is not done. We need to keep the faith. Yesterday was a big step, but in the weeks and months ahead, as our bishop posted on Facebook last night, the healing of our nation is all of our work to do. So I want to invite you to take a deep breath in. I want to invite you to lower your shoulders, unclench your jaw. Let's go to God together in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for every breath that we take and for every new grace that you offer to us. We thank you for our church, for our neighbors, for those who vote like us, and for those who don't. On this week, God, we remember the veterans who have fought to ensure our freedoms as Americans. And we offer a prayer of thanksgiving as we thank them for their service of our country. And we ask that God would bring a peace that passes all understanding to our nation. Today, Lord, we want to lift up and pray for Rich. We pray for the Logan family. We pray for a friend having surgery and for Paul's son, Jeff. We pray for Marion and Elena and for Tom. And in these moments of silence, we lift up the other names that you have placed on our hearts today. Lord, we are your church, and we know that as we offer our concerns and our celebrations to you, we need you and we need one another. So may we not become divided in heart, but may we do as Bishop Sue Halpert Johnson says, may we heal our way forward. I'll share with you the prayer that she shared yesterday. God of red and blue states, God of purple people, hear our prayer. After the election, some will rejoice, let them not gloat. After the election, some will grieve. Let them not despair. Heal our way forward, God. Soften our hardened hearts. Inspire us to be just, kind, and humble. Lord, may we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to hope. This is our prayer today. And the church said, Amen. Good morning, everyone. So let me just address the obvious here. Yes, I did break my foot. And no, they did not have green walking boots there at the ER. Had to go with black. I wish I had a better story for you. I just walked into a piece of furniture. That's all that happened. But today we're going to continue our examination of repentance in the Gospel of Luke. And in just a moment, we'll hear some of Jesus' words on the topic. But first, I wanted to share with you a little anecdote from my childhood. When I was growing up, it came to my attention that skateboarding was cool. And I think this may have been due in large part to the popularity of the movie Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox, whose character rode around in the movie and did a lot of cool things on a skateboard. I know that's why I was interested in buying one. Funny thing, though, once I actually had the thing under my feet, I couldn't do the things on my skateboard that Michael J. Fox was doing on his in Back to the Future. So anyway, skateboarding was kind of popular. And as many of you know, skateboarders are simply not welcome in very many places. 
One does not have to look far to find some kind of a no skateboarding sign posted. So the rallying cry for skateboarders growing up became skate or die, if any of you remember that, skate or die. And at the heart of that cry, it's pretty obvious. If they couldn't skateboard, then life simply enough, simply enough was not worth living for them, skate or die. Now let me tell you, I wasn't so much among the skate or die crowd. When I first got my skateboard and realized I could barely even stand on the thing, I just quickly tucked it away in my closet and said, I'll just stick with baseball or whatever sport I happened to be playing at the time. So as far as skate or die was concerned, I just wasn't quite there with it. Jesus, though, in Luke's gospel in chapter 13, makes a similar statement. Not about skateboarding, of course, but about repentance. So let me share with you what he says. Luke 13 and verses 1 through 5. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. So the cry from Jesus here, if you will, is not skate or die, of course. It's actually repent or die. Or in today's translation, repent or perish. So what we're going to do with this passage today, we're going to look at it from a couple of different angles. And the first angle we're going to look at says this. It's not about how we die not about how we die. Now here's what I mean by that. We're all going to die, and I'm sure you're all well aware of that. We're all going to die. How we die has nothing to do with kind of where we are in the eyes of God, okay? How we die has absolutely nothing to do with it. And this is the point that Jesus is making, particularly in verses 1 and 2 and 4. In verses 1 and 2, some people here were talking to Jesus about, it says, the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now this is our same Pilate whom Jesus encounters in the Gospels, in the crucifixion accounts. And history tells us that Pontius Pilate was very adept at squelching rebellion. In other words, if the people under Pilate's rule failed to toe the line with the Roman authorities, Pilate would put them down, and he would put them down hard and fast. And when Pilate ordered a rebellion to be put down, he made an example out of people, just in case there might be some others out there thinking rebellious thoughts. Now what these people were talking about here in verse 1 were some folks from Galilee who were apparently just dutifully going to make their sacrifices to God and just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Something must have irked Pontius Pilate, and he said, kill them all. Now, Jesus' reply here in verse 2 is very interesting. He responds with a question. He says, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Now, do you think that this was maybe on the minds of some of these people? Like, divine retribution, maybe. Like, these people were bad people, and that's why God caused or allowed this to happen to them. Or, like, I made fun of Baker Mayfield in my sermon a few weeks ago, and now I have a broken foot. Something like that. Divine retribution, maybe. Jesus gives another example in verse 4. He says, or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? You know, like God is watching over things like, all those 18, they're so awful. If I ever get a chance to take them out, oh my gosh. They're all standing by the Tower of Siloam right now. Here's my chance. Let's topple the tower. So the question Jesus is raising here is probably one we raise often ourselves, quite frankly. Why? Right? Why did this happen? Why, when these faithful people are going to make their sacrifices to God, why would God allow them to be slaughtered like that? Or why, when these people are just walking through Siloam in Jerusalem, why would God allow this tower to fall on them? 
See, the thinking of the day was that agonizing experiences like these were signs of God's disfavor and judgment. You know, like those Galileans were slaughtered because they were sinners, or the tower fell on those people because they were sinners. And Jesus' response to suggestions such as these is unequivocally no. See, Jesus opts to use these tragedies as a teaching moment. And we can also examine some of the tragedies that we experience in this same light. Terrorism, natural disasters, sickness and disease, pandemics, accidents, murder, and the list goes on. So the question before us then is whether or not these tragedies happen to people as a result of God's judgment. And Jesus' answer here is no. Jesus' answer is, that's life. These people died precisely because they are people. They are living things, and living things die. Now the point here, church, is this. We are somehow at the same time bodily mortal and spiritually immortal. Bodily mortal, spiritually immortal, and looking forward to bodily resurrection, right? See, Jesus' primary concern here is to move people beyond how we die and move them more toward how we live. What Jesus is saying here is when people die, it is tragic. And when people are killed in something like an accident or a mass shooting, that's really tragic. But if a person is killed in an accident or something similar, it has absolutely no bearing on their standing before God. If someone is murdered, it's tragic, still has no bearing on their standing before God. I know people, I'm sure you know people, long battles with disease, maybe cancer, they ultimately succumb and they die, and it is tragic, but again, it has no bearing on their standing before God. Now, I'm not trying to sound cold or insensitive. I'm just trying to faithfully echo Jesus here because he's, what, he, what he's saying to us is that there are bigger things at stake here than just the death of our mortal bodies, okay? And just like the people witnessed in Galilee and in Siloam, the death of our mortal bodies can happen unexpectedly at any time. See, Jesus actually answers these questions that he poses, In verse 2, he asks, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? And then he answers his question in verse 3, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, he says, you will all perish just as they did. He says the same thing in verse 5 about the tower falling in Siloam. Were they worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? Again, he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Now, is Jesus saying here that if these people do not repent, a tower is going to fall on them as well? No, that's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that if these people do not repent, something worse is going to overtake them, that being spiritual catastrophe. And we know that with whatever shape our spirits are in, this has material world consequences, right? For ourselves and for our neighbors, and not to mention the eternal ramifications of the shape of our spirits. So Jesus is calling here, obviously, for repentance. Now again, what does it mean to repent? Remember metanoia, to change the mind, right? to renew our minds into the mind of Christ, to live no longer from our own understandings or experiences, but to live instead from the mind, from the example, and from the teaching of Jesus. Jesus spins us round. This is repentance. And the call of Jesus here in this passage is to repent and to avoid a worse disaster than just bodily expiration. See, what Jesus is saying to us is that it's not how we die that determines or reveals our standing before God, tragic death or otherwise, it's how we live. That's what's going to determine where you and I are with God. Repent 
or perish is the call of Christ in this passage. Christ's apostle Peter offers that same call to us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 where he writes, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So you see, friends, whether it's Luke or whether it's Peter or whether it's Jesus or whether it's anywhere else we might go to in the scriptures, the choices are always the same. Repent or perish. Walk with God, renew the mind, live for God, love your God, love your neighbor, or bear the consequences of not doing so. Now, just like we talked about last week, repentance is a call for change, right? And repentance, quite frankly, is hard work. Repentance is admitting that I'm actually not fine the way that I am. Repentance is confessing and apologizing to God, and sometimes even to other people, for the harm that we've done in God's world. Repentance is getting into the Bible, learning from Jesus, learning from others and with others, renewing our mind into the mind of Christ, and living and loving accordingly. Repentance is a changed life. Repentance is all of that over and over again for the duration of our earthly existence. Now, this message does not sit very well with many American churchgoers who have bought into our predominant church cultures, what many call easy believism, right? A mindset that says, if I just believe in Jesus, if I just have faith in Jesus, I'll be good to go. Well, church, I really hope we're past that by now because Jesus is very clear here. He does not say believe or perish. He says repent or perish. And repentance, if you recall from last week, is a call for change, a call for different outcomes in our lives, different results in accord with the will of God and the fruits of the Holy Spirit for all humanity and for all creation. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the tale of Jonah in the Old Testament. Got swallowed by a whale, right? Or more accurately, a great fish. Well, Jesus talks about Jonah here too in the Gospel of Luke. In chapter 11 and verse 32, he says, The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and see something greater than Jonah is here. Okay, so let's talk about Jonah. Many of you know this story. God told Jonah to go at once to Nineveh, right? That great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Well, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh at all. And so he boarded a ship going in the complete opposite direction. He's tossed into the sea during a storm, and it's here that Jonah is swallowed up by the great fish. So the great fish swallows Jonah, and then it spewed Jonah out on dry land, and now we'll pick it up at Jonah chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. 
So what was the choice that was laid before the Ninevites? Repent or perish, right? Just like we've been hearing elsewhere this morning. So Jonah finally gets to this city via a large fish, finally delivers God's message. Forty days more, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And what happened? Again, just like Jesus said, they repented. And in verse 5, it says, they believed God. They believed Jonah's message. And what followed on the heels of that belief was this, mourning and sorrow and a fast. And the king declared that all the people were to cry mightily to God and they were to turn, repent, right? Turn from their evil ways and from the violence that was in their hands. Again, just like last week, right? Stopping the sinful behavior, stopping the harmful behavior, and replacing that behavior with good and righteous behavior. See, here again, we see the connection between genuine belief and action. We know the people of Nineveh believed God because of what they did, right? Because they changed, they repented, their belief in God inspired new directions in their lives, new outcomes, and God, as it reads in verse 10, spared Nineveh because of what they did, how they repented, how they turned from their evil ways. And this is a question we often ask as well, I think, how do we know, right? How do we really know if we're saved? if we've repented, where we are in the eyes of God? Well, again, Jesus answers that for us. He tells a parable, back again now in Luke 13, picking it up at verse 6, he says, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So two choices are laid before us by Jesus, right? Repent or perish. And these are the only two options Jesus gives us here, repent or perish. Now, my guess is that each of us would choose repentance over the alternative, and my guess is as well that each of us would kind of like to know for sure that we're really on that repentance track. Well, how did God know? How would we know that the Ninevites believed? Because of what they did, right? They repented, they prayed, they fasted, they changed their lives, they bore fruit in their lives worthy of the repentance that John the Baptist called for a week ago. So it's the same thing with us, friends. Repentance produces fruit. Repentance yields change in our lives. Repentance means change. So what we can do, how we can know, is we can look at our lives and simply ask, is my life looking more and more and more like Jesus or not? Is there fruit of love and peace and kindness and generosity more and more or not? So here's the good news for us today, friends. There's always good news with God. And the parable that Jesus shared at the end of this passage, the man who planted the fig tree was ready to get rid of it because it was not producing fruit, right? It was useless, he said, and just wasting the soil. But the gardener said, sir, give it another year. Let's see what happens. If it's not bearing fruit, then, then yeah, let's get rid of it. So again, the good news is that by God's grace, we're not dead yet. Just like the fig tree, there is still time for us to keep producing or to start producing some fruits of repentance like Jesus calls for. Repent or perish. These are the choices, the only two choices Jesus gives us, repent or perish. So it's an easy response to the passage this morning. Am I bearing the fruits of repentance in my life? Am I changing my mind in the power of the Holy Spirit? Am I renewing my mind 
in the scriptures and through Christian discipleship is my life producing new results and new outcomes in accord with God's will. Now, friends, that fig tree was on borrowed time, wasn't it? Borrowed time. It had a year to start producing some fruit, or it was done. One year. So, how much time do we have left? We can never really know, can we? So, let's repent. And let's bear the good fruits of repentance that we and our world need so desperately. Let's pray. Holy God, again this week we confess our sins and we ask for your forgiveness. God, we thank you for Jesus who shows us the way and who gives us the power to bear fruit in our lives worthy of repentance. So help us, Lord, to follow Jesus faithfully, not only for our own good, but for the good of others and for the good of your creation. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, we're going to be receiving a new member um, into our fellowship. So, Andrew, if you're still here, you didn't ditch out on us? Okay, come on up here. And you have a twin brother. It is you, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, we have historic questions that we ask you in the United Methodist Church, but one thing we look at here um, in Lorraine Lighthouse United Methodist Church uh, for those uh, inquiring about membership is our one, 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 right? One worship service, which Andrew's here pretty much every week. One small group for discipleship, which I've seen Andrew in several different small group settings. And three is service and ministry, which Andrew's playing the guitar. That's your service. That's your ministry. Very cool. Um, so I'm going to ask you these questions and I'll feed you the answers because you've gone through the membership classes. You already know the answers. So it's just a formality. Good questions, though. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful me a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? If so, say, I will. So church membership is just as much about the individual here on the stage as it is about all of you, so I have a couple questions for you as well. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Andrew now before you in your care? If so, say, we will. Thank you. Now would you help me welcome and celebrate Andrew's commitment to the church? Okay, so just a couple of questions for you. Repent or perish? Which one? <laughs> Repent. All right. Skate or die? Which one? Not a skateboarder? Okay, that's cool. Okay, so that's for you. There's all kinds of cool stuff in there. You win the chocolate factory. So would you join me in prayer now, and we'll pray over Andrew as he makes this uh, faithful commitment to the church. God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you, Andrew, and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Thank you. Normally I'd shake your hand or hug you or something, but it is what it is. But we're going to uh, continue with our worship services, service this morning. Andrew's going to go right to serving and living out his membership vows. So I'd invite you to stand and we'll sing together as we close our service. And I know we did this song last week, so you all know it. <laughs> um, but it just fit so well with the message this week that... I, I felt, we all felt, it was 
great to just keep it in. And it is such an amazing song. Um, and it speaks a lot. Repent or perish. And God's amazing grace is always there for us all the time. So please join with me. As I said, you know the words. Let's sing loud for the Lord. One, two, four. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. So I'll leave you with a warning. Watch out for the furniture in your house. And I'll leave you with a benediction. Hold back and wonder what might have been, or choose God and rejoice in the many ways you will see God's love at work in the world. Life is all about choices. Which will we choose? This answer can make all the difference. Go in peace and in God's grace. Amen. Amen.